Wolf Alice. A forest on the edge of fairy tale. Spilt glistening milk of moonlight on the frost crisp grass. A vixen bar. This way! Keep going! Keep up! Don't lose her! This way! Did you get her? Fire again! Four, five, six guns. Knife the rock. Christ, stop! Look at this! It's a child! Oh, watch out! It fights! Tie it up! We'll take it to the convent! Wide shoulders, long arms, and she sleeps curled in a ball. Nothing about her is human, except that she is not a wolf. Like the wild beasts, she lives only in the present tense, without hope or despair. She thinks she's a wolf, Mother Superior. Ah. There are calluses on her elbows, hands and knees. She won't stand upright. She fights off the novices. Such filth, such tangles, such vermin. Mm. With kindness and patience, she's learned to recognise her own dish and drink from a cup. It's hard to gather her nakedness, even with a simple shift. We give thanks to the Lord for the miraculous recovery of our sister Alice from the wild beasts. Kneel, Alice, before the Lord and give thanks for his mercy that has redeemed you. Amen. The child is here, my Lord. Wait here. Someone will come. No one will come. The Duke, seer as old paper, lives all alone but for this child as strange as he is. His bedroom is painted terracotta, rusted with a wash of pain. But nothing can hurt him since he ceased to cast an image in the mirror. The Duke sleeps in an antlered bed of dull black iron until the moon, governess of transformations and overseer of synambulists, strikes his face. His eyes huge, rapacious, inconsolable, eaten up by swollen, gleaming pupil, open to devour the world. The white light scours the fields till everything gleams, and he will leave paw prints in the hoar frost when he runs howling round the graves. He is white as leprosy, corpse eater, body snatcher, Nothing deters him. <clears throat> Stuff the corpse with garlic. Cadaver mm. Provencal. He uses the Holy Cross as his scratching post and crouches at the font to lap up holy water. Coffin ripped open as a child tears open a present on Christmas morning, and no trace but a rag of the bridal veil caught fluttering in the brambles at the castle gate. She sleeps in the ashes. Beds are a trap. We trained her in a few small tasks. She sweeps the hair, vertebrae, and phalanges that litter his room into a dustpan makes up his bed at sunset when he leaves it. If you could transport her to the Eden of our first beginnings, where Eve and grunting Adam squat on a daisy bank, 
picking the lice from one another's pelts. Then she might prove to be the wise child who leads them. And her silence and her howling as authentic as any language of nature. In a world of talking beasts and flowers, she would be the bud of flesh in the kind lion's mouth. But how can the bitten apple flesh out its scar again? Her first blood bewilders her. And the first stirrings of surmise she has ever felt are directed to its cause. The moon is shining into the kitchen when she wakes at the trickle between her thighs. It seems to her that a wolf who was fond of her and who lived perhaps in the moon must have nibbled her while she slept. Nips too gentle to wake her but sharp enough to break the skin. She looks for rags to sop the blood. She finds towels, sheets and pillowcases in closets that have not been opened since the Duke came shrieking into the world with all his teeth to bite his mother's nipple off and weep. Heaped in the corners of his bloody chamber are shrouds, night dresses and burial clothes that wrapped items in the Duke's menu. She tears strips to clumsily diaper herself. In the course of her prowling, she bumps against that mirror over whose surface the Duke passes like wind over ice. A reflection. A stranger who mimics every gesture. When she raises her forepaw or drags her bum on the dusty rug to scratch, she feels the smooth, cool barrier between them, but is lonely enough to bare her teeth in an invitation to play, which is accepted. Moonlit and pale in the Duke's empty bedchamber, Wolf Alice wonders if this is the creature who came to her at the full moon. They pass on the stairs. The Duke with the leg of a man over his shoulder. She is incurious, serene and inviolable in her verminous innocence. The bleeding ceases. She forgets it till the moon reappears and it begins again. She learns to expect the blood to watch the cycle of the moon waxing and waning, to prepare her rags and bury them neatly afterwards. Sequence asserts itself, and she understands the circumambulatory principle of the clock. Though all are banished from this den, where she and the Duke inhabit their separate solitudes. The damned Duke haunts the graveyard. He believes himself both less and more than a man. One chance, one chance only. Poor lad, half out of his mind with grief. His wife dead on their wedding day, <laughs> and then the body taken. God save us. Did you bring the wolf traps? During the day, he sleeps. The mirror reflects his bed, but never the meagre shape under the disordered covers. On those white nights alone in the house, Alice examines her new breasts with curiosity. The white growths remind her of night-sprung puffballs in the woods. She shows them to her mirror litter mate, who reassures her with the same. She finds his grandmother's ball gowns, rose and suave velvet and a brace of lace the feeling of it delightful to her adolescent skin. Always copied, Alice comes to the regretful conclusion that her friend is no more than an ingenious shadow. She pokes her nose behind the mirror, only dust and white rags, a dress stuffed out of sight. A little moisture seeps from her eyes, 
now she knows that she is seeing herself in the mirror of a new intimacy. She pulls the white dress, torn and crumpled, tries her front legs and the sleeves. The dress is so white, of such sinuous texture, that she yearns to wash off her coat of grey ash. In the mirror, she sees how this dress makes her shine. Although she cannot run on two legs in petticoats, she trots out in her new dress to investigate the odiferous October hedgerows like a debutante, delighted with herself, but wistful at the wolves howling because now she has put on the visible sign of her difference from them. Go, go. The young widower of the dead bride has spent a long time preparing his revenge. He's filled our church with an arsenal of bells, books and candles. He sent for help from the city. Ten gallons of holy water blessed by the archbishop himself. If the silver bullets don't do it, we'll drown him. The villagers gather to greet the one who visits at the first death of winter. Her nostrils twitch to catch the rank stench of the dead that tells her the Lord of Cobweb Castle is at hand, intent on his cannibal rituals. Poor wounded thing. Locked half and half between such strange states. An aborted transformation, an incomplete mystery. The Duke lies writhing on his black bed in the room like a Mycenaean tomb. She is fearful at the sound of pain, in case it hurts her as it did before. She prowls the room, sniffing his wound. Pitiful as her gaunt grey mother, she leaps on the bed and licks without hesitation, without disgust, with a quick, tender gravity, the blood and dirt from his cheeks and forehead. As she continues her ministrations, little by little, there appears in the mirror glass, like an image on photographic paper. First, a formless web of tracery. Then, in firmer but still shadowed outline, until at last, as vivid as real life, as if brought into being by her soft, moist, gentle tongue, finally emerges in reflection the face of the Duke. <laughs> 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 